Here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to spend the first half of our time together, and I kind of want to coach you, okay? So picture me uh, in coach, not coach shorts. That's, that's weird, all right? Uh, picture me, just, just picture me as just trying to come alongside you, try to help you, uh, and then I want to spend the back half trying to pass you, okay? And here, here's how I want to do that. I want to talk about resolutions. I want to talk about uh, resolutions of any time type, but New Year's resolutions in particular. How many of you know uh, that about an 80% clip, we don't do by February what we said we're going to do in January? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I don't like to fail, and I don't like to see good, godly, good-looking people like y'all, y'all fail. So I, what I think is that we make random decisions uh, with no infrastructure and no habits for us to actually do what we say we want to do. And, and that's, that's why we fail. And so, so here, here's what I want to do. I want to give you some biblical understanding about how to go into a new season. I want to give you some things to think about in 21 Days of Prayer. And then I want to help you craft a spiritual plan for 2024. Does that sound good? Okay. I appreciate both of you saying that. Any of the rest of you good? You good? <laughs> I'm going to do it whether you say yes or not. All right? All right. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. This is where I want to start. Uh, it, it teaches us this. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so easily and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now here's how I think that we hear that verse, that I need to get rid of some things so that I can go faster, right? As an American, I think I wanna, I wanna go fast, I wanna get it done well and quickly and then get on to the next. But the author of Hebrews uh, isn't talking about going fast. He's talking about going far, and that's different. Going fast and going far are two different things. When you open up your Bible, the Bible almost never talks about getting something done quickly. It does talk a tremendous amount about finishing well, about finishing faithfully, about doing well with what's right in front of you, not trying to get it done quick, not worrying about what comes next, just stacking up good days and faithfulness all the way to the finish line. So I take that idea in Hebrews chapter 12 and I go over the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians has an interesting sequence to it. The end of the book of Ephesians ends with, stand therefore, right? Spiritual warfare, victory, authority, all the things that we're going to need in the next 21 days of prayer. We need to stand in our faith. We need to stand in our relationship with God. But that's That's where it ends. That's not where it begins. In the middle of the book, Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says, hey, I want you to walk worthy of the vocation that you're called by. Not stand, not this kind of stand, all right? I want you to walk worthy. So it ends at stand. In the middle, it's walk. But at the beginning, Ephesians chapter 2, he says, let me remind you that you're seated in heavenly places. Okay, so the end, the finish, is that we could stand fruitfully, faithfully, finish well in our faith. The middle is that I want to walk out where I'm headed, but the beginning, if I want to go far, is that I got to learn to sit. Part of the reason that we struggle with resolutions is because we do this. Fire! Ready! Aim! You got, did you hear what happened? Yeah, we just pick random stuff. We just pick random stuff. And, 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 and hear me, in the spiritual, if you're going to decide a direction, you first have to know how to stop, rest, receive, be still, and know that he is God. You don't start with standing. You don't start with running. You don't even start with walking. You start with sitting. And if you're going to go far, you have to learn to sit and receive and hear from God. Okay, so two things that I want to teach you today that I ask God to teach us. Uh, to go far, you first have to sit. To go far, you have to see clearly. So let's take the first one. To go far, what are some things that I want you to be thinking about as we go into 21 days of prayer? What are some things that I, I want you to hear from God on that I don't want you to move until you hear from God? Because we're not trying to start with standing. We're trying to start with sitting. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. The first thing is that for me, when I am thinking about a new season and I'm trying to sit, I do two things. Number one, I pray and I fast. That's what we're actually going to do as a church to start the new year. We're going to pray first. We're, we're going we're to sit and receive and do what feels like nothing first so that 
in the remainder of the year, we can walk and ultimately stand and finish well. But if we start over here, we, we won't get where we're trying to go. So, so why do we do 21 days of prayer? Because you need to start with hearing from God. You need to start with receiving. So listen to me. I, I want you to be ambitious this year. Okay? I, I, don't, I don't have any issue with, I think there's a biblical argument for ambition. I want you to be ambitious. I want you to go get whatever God puts in front of you. But understand there's a difference between worldly ambition and godly ambition. Here it is. Worldly ambition is driven Godly ambition is led. Worldly ambition says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get there fast. I'm going to go through and, and toward whatever I need to do to get what I want. Godly ambition says, God, whatever you call me to do, I'm going to follow you in and I'm going to finish well. But Lord, I'm not going to move until I hear from you. I'm not going to move until I hear from you. And so as a church for 21 days, we tithe the beginning of our year. And prayer isn't just going in a room and talking, okay? Prayer is going in a room and, yes, talking, but also listening. That's why we do it for 21 days, because I know you got a lot to say to God, right? I know you have a lot on your heart, a lot on your mind, a lot that you want to say to God. And so I want you to take the first week, and I want you to say what you got to say. But then those second two weeks, once you've said what you've got to say, I want you to hear what God has to say back. Prayer isn't just you talking to God. Prayer is a conversation that you have with God. So then why do we fast? Why is fasting so important in the Bible? So let's imagine my, my friend Jenny is sitting right over here. We went to Iraq together. Come on, somebody. You're a friend if you go to Iraq with somebody else. All right. So let's imagine that coming back from that mission trip, Jenny and I go to coffee, my wife and, and Jenny and I, we go to coffee, and, and I say, Jenny, how's it been going, man? Th things going well with you? Tell me all about it. And as soon as she starts talking, I reach into my pocket and I pull out my phone. I go, yeah. Oh, that's great, yeah. Yeah, I'll take a, a, a venti double quad caramel macchiato with an extra splash of blobby bloop for $14. Yeah, cool. No, no, hang on, I'm listening. Yes, yes. And, Oh, hey, man, hi. Hey, yep. hey, hang on, this is super important to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know what? Just one, I got to go to the bathroom real quick. Just one, I'll be right back, right? right. Yeah. And then I got to call. Yeah. It, if I do that, is Jenny going to feel like I'm interested in what she has to say? No. If I say to Jenny, Jenny, how's things been going? How, how, how's, your, how's, your, how's your family doing? How, how's your mom doing? What does she want me to do? She wants me to exhibit a posture of listening, which is this. I take my phone. I put it in my pocket. I wait for the order. I hold it. Come on, somebody. All right? I'm not worried about who's coming in. She has my entire attention. In order for me to listen well, I have to stop doing other things. That's what fasting is. Fasting is, hey, God, I want to talk to you and I want to hear from you, but I acknowledge that there's some things that distract me from your voice, and in this season, I'm going to get rid of them. In this season, I'm, going to, I'm not going to eat. In this season, I'm not going to watch. In this season, I'm not going to go. It doesn't really matter what you fast from as long as your fast brings focus to your conversation with God. And so before you come back tonight, and you're coming back tonight, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I appreciate both of you. I don't know what, what's happening today, all right? Yeah, yeah, come back tonight. I want you to decide what you're going to fast from. I want you to decide spiritually what does it look like for you to put your phone in your pocket and to... Wipe out other voices, okay? So, so first to sit, we, we pray and we fast. And let me give you, let me give you two other grids, and I'm going to go quickly because I want to get to the pastoring part. Uh, I, I want you to think about posture, and I want you to think about pace. Okay, now if I were you, and I were going to be doing these, I'd be writing these things down. Yes, no one's writing them. You're all just looking at me. She's writing them. You're doing great, sis. There's a special blessing in heaven for you. The rest of y'all, whatever, right? Okay. Uh, let's think about our new year in, in this regard. Let's think about it in the context of posture. So I have a friend, his name's Kyle Turner. He pastors a church here in Kansas City. Great church. My friend turned 42 years old, young guy. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and when he turned 42, he said, you know what I want to do for my 42nd birthday? I want to go run 42 miles without training. I don't know why you're clapping. That's the dumbest <laughs> idea I've ever heard. So he calls me, he's like, bro, I'm on my way down to Texas. What are you going down to Texas for? I'm going to run 42 miles. What? Why? He goes, because I turned 42. Again, why? I don't, I don't. So after I, I couldn't get my head around why he did it, so I said, so, so how did it go? 
And he said, it was incredible. I said, really, what made it incredible? Did you finish? Because the point is finishing, not just running, not just starting. The point is finishing. He said, yeah, I finished. I said, how did you finish? He said, I didn't think about that I had to go 42 miles. I just thought about the mile that I was on. So hear me. Distance is daily. How do I get into the distance? By doing today the way that God tells me to do it. My posture isn't, God, I want to follow you in 2024. Here's why. Because you don't know if you get 2024. I don't want to be morbid about it, but you might be in heaven by the end of 2024. You don't, you don't get tomorrow. God tells us in no uncertain terms. Hey, don't be confident of tomorrow. I gave you today with a special blessing of new mercy this morning. And so the posture of following God, once I've heard from God, isn't now for the rest of this year. No, no, today, God. Today, I want to hear from you. Today, I want to walk with you. Today, I want to obey you. Today, I want to listen to you, God. And today, I want to be mindful of the other things that I trust that are little G gods that get in the way of me following you today. Let me give you an example. When you get tired, do you pray or do you drink caffeine? When you get bored, do you read your Bible or do you watch Netflix? When you get, when you get feeling some kind of way, do you scroll or do you spend time with your small group? Yeah, here's why. I'm not dogging you. We all do it. But we all, your faith isn't a crutch, but you have crutches that you put your faith in. Caffeine and Netflix and, and, and it just, I got to get my mind off this, so I'm going to drink it, smoke it, watch it, scroll it, binge it. And those are the things you should fast during 21 days of prayer because they are the things that you trust day in and day out. And they're taken away from. So your posture is, God, I want to, it's not this year, it's today. And then today, I want to have a pace to the way that I live my life. Are y'all still with me? Yes. Ephesians 5, look carefully how you walk. Don't walk as the unwise, but as the wise. Make the best use of your time. How much time do you have? Today. Make the best use of today. Why? Because the days are evil. It's interesting. God says it's crazy out there. <laughs> and let's just call it what it is. 2024 is going to be wild in this country. You know that, right? Yeah. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to not get caught up in all that. I need you to use your time well. What does the Bible say? Because the days are evil, make the best use of your time. Don't go on social media and talk trash. Make the best use of your time. Why? Because you might not get tomorrow. You might not need to worry about the election. So make the best use of today. So three categories of time in the Bible. One is work. The second is rest. The third is waste. That's it. That's the only categories. Now, work isn't where you go to do the thing. Work is exertion of any kind. Leading, building, serving, giving. The things that you put yourself into. And here's what the Bible says, John 9. We must work the works of him who sent us while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. There's a time stamp on the work that God has called you to. So let's be about it. Let's be about that work. That's the first category. The second category is rest. And rest isn't just sleep. Rest is anything that I do to enjoy, to think, to remember, to have fun, the things that are life-giving to me. And so the Bible says in Exodus and Deuteronomy, six days shall you labor and do all your work. In these six days, get done everything that you can get done. But the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. What is, what is a Sabbath? It's a time to rest and remember who God is. It's a time to acknowledge limitations. So listen, you got to look at your time because what God has called you to is both worth that time and you're the only one who can do it. That's what calling is. But you also have to acknowledge in your work that you're limited. So you got to take a break. You got to take a Sabbath. You got to have a plan to rest. And, and so for me, it looks like one day out of the week, I don't work. One couple day period in a quarter, I try to withdraw. Once a year, I take a vacation. We Americans are terrible at vacation. I can't afford to take a vacation. Baby, you can't afford to not take one. 
I don't mean go to Bali. I mean don't work for an extended period of time. Have a plan. Have a plan for your work. Have a plan for your rest. And can I also say this? Have a plan for your waste. So three words. You ready for it? Scroll, veg, binge. None of those worth anything when it comes to work or rest. Because you're not resting when you're doing this. Are you? It's not life-giving. Let's just do an experiment. Go home today, and for two hours, just scroll on Instagram, and then consciously think to yourself, do I feel better or worse now that I've done this? Yeah, so scrolling isn't resting, and it's certainly not working, right? Uh, Vegging, okay? I don't know why when we veg, our mouth has to be open. (laughs) Yeah. I want you to look, I want you to, I want you to, in 2024, express greater care for the work that God has called you to do. And I want you to plan to rest, and I want you to minimize waste. Why? Because what you do matter. It matters. The work that you put your hand to, it matters. Let me, let me give you one more as it pertains to your time. I'm trying to coach you here. No coach shorts, just the whistle and the eye black. All right, I'll get rid of it in a second. Uh, anchor habits. So what, what is an anchor habit? It, it's, a, it's a habit that isn't efficient, but it promotes health. So let me give you a couple. Coming to church, it's not efficient. You got stuff you could be doing right now, right? And you're at church listening to a bald guy talk about coat shorts and eye black. It's not efficient. It's not supposed to be. But it does promote health. 21 days of prayer is the least efficient thing that we do but it promotes health. Reading the Bible and praying, it's not efficient. Some of y'all are trying to make it efficient. You put your phone on like eight times, right? I'm gonna try to read my Bible in 38 seconds. No, 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 no. Just go slow. Pray, go slow. It's not efficient, it's not supposed to be. Dating your spouse. You wanna be married? Date your spouse. Give it time, once a week. Once a week, give it time. Spend time with your spouse. Go someplace where I can't afford. Fine, stay home. Turn off the TV. Turn off the phones. Sit down at the table with nothing else. Look into each other's eyes and remind yourself that you used to be in love. Once a week. It's not efficient. It's not supposed to be. Our, our day in the Dunn house is Friday mornings. We get up. We take the kids to school. We go lift weights, and then we go to breakfast together. You say, that sounds terrible. Well, you're not invited. It's not for you, all right? <laughs> If you think my idea sounds bad, come up with your own idea and tell me what it is. It's not efficient, but it promotes health. How about this? Physical exercise. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of Christians understanding that God has a call on their life that affects somebody's eternity and not taking care of this body that God has given you. Get a gym membership, take a walk, move around, why? Because what you do matters. Take care of yourself, we need you. Take care of yourself, I'm tired of visiting Christians in the hospital for ailments that they should not have because they would not stop putting it in their mouth. Christians need to, couple people, are we clapping? We good? (laughs) These are spiritual things. The Bible talks about your body as a temple. So consider the spiritual nature of your body. So watch. How do I know if it's an anchor? It's not efficient, but if I stop doing it, just take church. Don't come to church for six months. See how it goes. You're like, no, I already did that. That's why I'm here today. Don't read your Bible for six months. Don't pray for six months. Don't come to any 21 days of prayer and do your year on the own. Don't work out. Don't date your spouse. See how it goes. You say, I don't have time to do any of that. You, you are far too busy to not do it. Think about your time. And then lastly, lastly, is methods and mentors. Okay, prayer and fasting. You got it? Um, pace. Pace and posture, and then methods and mentors. So methods, what is God calling you, leading you into in 2024? 
and then how are you going to do it? Because knowing what you're supposed to do and knowing how you're going to do it are two different things. A lot of us have an idea of what God wants us to do, but because we don't know how to do it, we don't do anything. So as I'm going into 2024, during 21 days of prayer, God, what do you want me to do? And then God, how do you want me to do it? And here's the mentor piece. Who is already doing what you want me to do so they can help me do what you're calling me to do in this year? Okay. I want to get my finances straight in 2024. What's the next question? Who do you know that has their finances straight? Spend $8 on a cup of coffee and say to them, could you help me with my finances? I want to have a better relationship to my kids. Great. It's awesome. Who has a good relationship to their kids and what small group are you going to get into with them? I want to get in great shape. Great. Talk to Pastor Todd. Pastor Todd's in great shape. <laughs> no, no, no. Who? Who? This, this is what the church does. We don't just take ideas and try them on our own. No, we do them together. We're better together. So prayer and fasting. What is God wanting your posture to be, your pace to be? What is the method, what and how and who does God want to give you to mentor you, to bless you, to be a part of helping you get where God wants you to go? Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, now, here's the thing. My job isn't to help you with every area of your life. It's not my job. There are things that I don't know about your life. There are things I don't know how to do. Here's my job. My job is to invite you to put God first in 2024. That's my job. I can't do it. The Holy Spirit has to do a work in your life, but I have to, I have to introduce the idea to you. Uh, I have to help you give you an environment, 21 days of prayer, where you can hear from God and answer some of these questions. And the spiritual vision is the foundation for everything else. Hear what I'm saying? Your spiritual vision for 2024 is where everything else comes from. What you believe about the Bible is how you handle your finances, how you handle your family, how you handle your work, how you handle your future. If you don't have a spiritual foundation, you're on your own. So listen to what Habakkuk 2 and verse 2 says. And the Lord answered me, write this vision, write down what I'm saying to you, Habakkuk, make it plain, put it on tablets so that he that reads it might run with it. That's what, I, that's what I want you to do during 21 days of prayer. I want you to write down in clear language what God is saying so you can do what he's calling you to do. It's amazing to me in this country. We've got business plans, financial plans, health plans, build your social media platform plans, but no spiritual plans. No, no spiritual plans. And so where do we go to, to get our spiritual plan? Does God articulate for us the plans and purposes that he has for us in a really practical way? So I think that he does. I think that there are four things that God wants for all of us in 2024. And I think it's incumbent on us as we're being led, because we're not just believers, we're followers, to consider, God, if these are the things that you want to do, what conversations, God, do you and I need to have about how you want me to do that in 2024? Are you with me? Okay, so in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, God says for the first time the four things that he wants to do, and then he says them again and again and again and again and again all the way through the Bible. All the way through the Bible. Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7. Here it is. Say therefore to the people of Israel, so say to my covenant people, I am the Lord, and number one, I want to bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Number two, I will deliver you from slavery to them. Number three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Number four, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you will know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's the four things that God wants to do. Let's unpack them. Coat shorts off, suit jacket on. Come on, somebody, all right? Let's ask God to pastor us right now and give us a vision for 2024. First thing is this. God says, number one, hey, I want to bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Okay, so for 400 years, the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt. Now, what does that mean? It means that it was generations of slavery. Whenever a Hebrew family 
had a kid, there didn't come a day where they said, hey, Johnny, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because they already knew the answer. You're going to be a slave. You don't have a choice. You were born into it. It's decided for you. It is a burden, a weight that is on your life. And God says, my plan for you is that I want to remove that burden. Now, slavery is historical and literal in the Old Testament, but it also gives us an idea of a spiritual reality because Egypt is a picture of the world and of sin. So say it this way. Everyone who's born into this world is born into this world with their future already decided for them. They're born into this world a slave to sin. They're born into this world according to the course of this world and the God of this world. They're born into a kingdom. You didn't have a choice. You were just born. And if we were thinking spiritually, we wouldn't say, Johnny, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because the answer would be, when I grow up, I'm going to be what I was born into. I'm going to be a sinner. And God says, here's my plan. I want to take that burden off of you. And so I'm going to send my son to this planet, and my son is going to do for you what you aren't able to do for yourself, because I want a relationship with you, because I want to save you, because I want to get you out of sin and death, and I want to make you a son and a daughter with a plan and a future that's assured by the blood of Jesus. Here's the plan. If you're not a follower of Jesus, here's what God wants for you. God wants to give you new life. That's what God wants. God wants a relationship with you. God wants you to know him and him to know you. God wants to set you free from what you were born into. Now, here's what's interesting. I don't think that God's plan was that the people of Israel got out of Egypt, got on the other side of the Red Sea, looked back and went, wow, that was great. I'm so happy that we're not in Egypt anymore. Isn't it awesome? Isn't it awesome? that God did this for us. Okay, some of you in 2024, God needs to save you, and some of you need the joy of your salvation restored to you. Some of you, you're a Christian, but you've never got in those baptismal waters and told anybody. Some of you, you are no longer in Egypt, but your faith isn't public, your faith isn't growing, and I just wanna declare for you in the name of Jesus that 2024 is the year that you get back to remembering the enjoyment of being a Christian. The enjoyment of being a Christian. Listen, I'm telling you, some of you have been saved for so long you don't even remember how to enjoy being saved. And you stand in this room with your arms crossed and a scowl on your face and all of your good theology, but nobody would know that you aren't in Egypt anymore. Nothing about you looks like it. God saved you from sin and death. Hey, wake up in 2024. Wake up and remember. Wake up and be assured. Wake up to all of the goodness and, here's how we say it, know and enjoy God in 2024. No one enjoy God. Enjoy God in 2024. Enjoy the presence of God. Enjoy the faithfulness of God. Enjoy God speaking to you. Enjoy being in a relationship. Enjoy the expectation that you didn't have before God saved you. You don't have expectation when you're a slave. You get up and you do it again. But when you're a son, when you're a daughter, there's expectation. Wonder what dad's going to do today. I wonder what, how dad's going to lead today. I wonder what dad's going to give me today. I want you to know and enjoy God in 2024. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? Well, you're going to spend time with God, and you're going to ask him how you're going to do that. Secondly, God says, I want to deliver you from slavery to them, which sounds redundant, doesn't it? I want to get you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I want to deliver you from slavery. I thought you already said that, God. Okay, so slavery is external and internal. God gets you out of Egypt, but he still has to get Egypt out of you. So what, here's what God's saying. I physically, you're no longer physically a slave, but you continue to act like, believe like, behave like a slave. Christian, you're forgiven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you die, you're going to heaven. But you act like a slave. A lot of Christians are that elephant with a little chain in the single post in the ground thinking that they can't break free of the thing that's got them stuck. You don't know how to just go, nope. 
No, 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 I, I, that's not who I am. No, 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 that, that's, that's, that's not what God has made me to be. I am neither a slave geographically or spiritually, uh, externally or internally. I am forgiven and I'm free. I know and enjoy God and I'm experiencing freedom in my life. Listen, so many Christians are out of the world, but the world still got them. And I'm not just talking about sin and carnality. I'm talking about trauma. I'm talking about regret. I'm talking about addiction. I'm talking about depression. The things that you don't think you can beat, even though you believe that the tomb is empty and the power of the resurrection is available to you. So, so, so how does God set us free? Okay, is the question. Are you still with me? So, so yes, God sets us free by Jesus. Yes, the Holy Spirit. But the medium that God uses to set us free is relationships. God sets us free by giving us friends. You, you say, why do, why do you say that? Well, well first off, because you can't get more free in isolation. Because getting free isn't about believing something. If it was about believing something, you would have already believed it and you would already be free. Getting free is about understanding that sometimes you have to borrow somebody else's freedom to get your own. So listen to what the Bible says. 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? You want to be forgiven, confess your sins to God. And then he uses the same language in James chapter 5. If we confess our sins to one another, not to God, and pray for one another, we will be healed, not forgiven, healed. The prayers of a righteous person avail much. So watch. You aren't going to ask somebody to pray for you that isn't your friend. You aren't going to ask somebody to pray for you so that you can be healed if you don't trust them enough to say, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm out of Egypt, but I'm struggling with addiction, depression, regret, uh, sexual sin, things that are holding me down that I can't get free of. Here's how you get free. You take the mask off and say, this is what it really is. And somebody imparts to you the optimism and love and grace of God that allows you to step out of the chain that the enemy has you in. This is a powerful thing. So, so many of us uh, need a friend. So many of us in 2024, we need to get into a small group. So many of us say, I don't need a small group. I need someone to teach me. Great. Uh, starting next week, you can sign up to get a mentor. You can sign up to get a mentor, somebody who can teach you the Bible and walk through life with you and come alongside you. But listen, you can't go where God wants you to go by yourself. If you could, you would have already. You need a friend. Let me just say something real quickly about this. Some of you, a lot of your trauma is tied to other relationships. So when I say you need to find friends, it kind of triggers something in you. So, so let me just slightly push back on that. Think about Jesus. Jesus picked 12 disciples, 12 friends, knowing that one of those 12 was going to betray him and knowing that all but one was not going to get to the cross with him. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about Jesus knowing that Judas was going to betray him and still inviting him into his life. I want you to think about Jesus knowing full well that Peter was going to deny him and that none of the disciples were going to get to the cross other than John, and he still invested himself in relationships. What, 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 what is true about that? that? That yes, relationships are hard. That yes, relationships sometimes provide trauma. That yes, relationships create vulnerability, but they are worth it and you need them to receive everything that God wants for you. Some of you in 2024, this is how we say it, I want you to find some friends. God, how am I going to know and enjoy you in 2024? And God, how am I going to find some friends? And God's probably going to say, well, you need to be a little more You said it, not me. <laughs> yeah, you need to be a little more friendly. You're probably going to have to put, put yourself out there. But what happens if? I, I'll meet you in that valley. But as long as you stay by yourself, you're staying here. Thirdly, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. The language that God uses here is of restoration. So watch. God says, you are not in Egypt and you are not a slave. And the church does this. We just tell you what you aren't. 
right? You're not that, don't do that, stop doing that, be warmed and filled, see you next Sunday. But what is God saying here? You're not in Egypt and you aren't a slave, so let me tell you what you are. Let me tell you what you are. It's not just what you are and where you are, it's, it's who you are. God says, I didn't create you to be in Egypt and I didn't create you to be a slave, so let me tell you what I did create you for. Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God pre pre prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lots of Christians walking around forgiven but not free, and if they are forgiven and free, they don't know what God saved them to. They don't know their calling. They don't know their spiritual gifts, and because of it, they lack shalom. What's shalom? It's not peace. It's wholeness. So you're one person at home, one person at church, one person at work. You're not the same person everywhere because you don't know who God says that you are. You only know who God says that you aren't. And so maybe in 2024, you need to, this is how we say it, you, you need to discover your purpose. But can I say this? Some of you, you've gone to growth track, you did the thing, you, you, you went through the process, but you know it, but you aren't, you aren't doing it. The blessing isn't ever in knowing. The blessing is in obeying. And some of you, I need you to go back to growth track so you can hear it again because 2024 is the year that you stop just not being something. And you start actually stepping into and doing who God created you to be. You discover your purpose. You have some friends around you. You're growing in your knowledge of and enjoyment with God. And then fourthly, and this is not my plan, this is God's plan for you. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. The verbiage that God uses here is of fulfillment. You aren't a slave, you're a son or a daughter. You aren't in bondage, you're forgiven, you're free, you're full, you're part of a family. You're clear on who you aren't and what you aren't, but you're also clear on who you are and what God's calling you to do. And then you are doing them. You're operating in them, in your true identity, in your family, in your gifts, and it's changing literally everything. This is why I say, if, if you don't have a plan, do Graceway's plan, and in six months, you won't recognize yourself. If you commit yourself to a spiritual plan of know and enjoy God, find friends, discover your purpose, and make a difference. Not my plan. Not my plan. It's God's plan. It will change everything. And as God's changing you, it will change the things around you. You see, we think making a difference, that's how we say it, is I have to go do something, and then when I do that thing, it will make a difference. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches if you'll be, if you know who you are and go be who you are, that will make a difference. You don't have to go do something. You just have to be who you are. And if you'll be who you are, God will use who he made you to be to make a difference in what's around you. Are you with me? Okay, here's how I want to finish and then I'll be in my seat. I started, uh, I do a Bible reading plan with the pastors. I do one uh, with my wife. And we came to Acts chapter 4 uh, earlier this week. It says this, Acts 4 and verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men. <laughs> Makes me laugh. Just some blue collar dummies. Right? They were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. You know, I... I wonder sometimes, what was the expectation of the disciples when Jesus called them? As they dropped their nets and started walking toward the Messiah, what did they think was going to happen? Were they walking along thinking, well, I wonder what will change. I wonder what will go better. I wonder what God will do. I wonder what it will feel like when the kingdom comes. Like all of, all of those questions going through their head. And if, if this verse is to be understood, it sounds like there were certain things that didn't change at all. Right? God called some uneducated common men to him, and at the end of their time together, the Pharisees say, y'all are still uneducated common, common dudes. That didn't change at all. So what changed? However, it does look like you've been with Jesus. That, that, that's what changed. So let me say it to you this way. This year, I hope you win. I do. I, I hope... 
I hope school goes incredible. I hope your business blows up. I hope you make a ton of money and can take care of everyone in your life. I hope you've hit your financial goals. I hope you hit your fitness goals. I, I, pray, I pray at the end of 24, four, you're, you're as jacked as Pastor Todd. <laughs> Love you, bro. Love you. Listen, I hope in 24, your mental health takes a, takes a turn. I hope you get free. I hope it's as well as ever. And I hope your relationships thrive. Your marriage, your kids, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors. I hope it all turns to gold. I do. But more than anything, I hope this. I hope that even if you get to the end of 2024 and nothing is different, I hope this is different that you've been with Jesus. You see, that's what made all the difference for the disciples. They were still blue collar dummies, but man, they had been with the Son of God. And that made all the difference. And at the end of 2024, I hope your business plan goes well. I hope your fitness plan goes well. I I hope all of the things go well, but make sure that if nothing else changes, this changes. I was with the Son of God, and it made all the difference. God, we love you today, and God, we thank you. We thank you that you make yourself available to us. God, we love you for being at work in our lives, and Lord, as we sit over the next 21 days, and yes, ask, and yes, request, and yes, declare, I pray that we also hear. I pray that we understand, Lord, that Christians aren't driven, they're led, and that you give us everything that we need for life and godliness. I pray that you put people in our lives to come alongside of us. I pray that we operate at a pace that is pleasing to you with a posture of I'm going to be faithful in today. And it's not about the distance, it's about today. But more than anything, God, I pray that when we get to the end of 2024, we've been with you. That we know you a little bit better and that we enjoy you more deeply and fully. I pray, Lord, that you put people around us who love us and who love you and that we borrow from one another and that we experience church as you intended it to be. I pray, Lord, that we discover and we align ourselves to who you say that we are, maybe for the very first time, not just knowing, but doing it, Lord. And I pray that you would fulfill us, that we would get to the end of this year and no matter what has changed, if we've spent time with you, I believe we won't recognize ourselves. I believe that you are in the change business. I believe that you are bringing the future kingdom into the present. I believe that life change is who you are and what you do. And I ask you, Lord, by your presence and your power for your glory and our joy to meet us here and change us and bless us and lead us. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.